Um, hi, everyone. I'm happy to join you this Earth Day. I'm Kendra Pilewitz, and I'm a climate reporter at the New York Times, where I focus on the science of climate change and the impact of a change in climate has on people. This month, we've been hosting a new digital five-part series called The Greenhouse, focused on the state of the planet 50 years after the very first Earth Day, launched in April 1970. Last week, we heard from Times visual journalists on new ways of using emerging technologies to capture the widespread effects of climate change for global audiences. And today we will discuss our recently published list of essential climate books for you to read, whatever your specific interest. We will also hear from author Amitav Ghosh, um, author of The Great Derangement, one of the books that made our top list. Uh, you may submit your questions at any time during the event in the Q&A window, uh, and please note that this event is being recorded. Uh, I'd like to introduce you to my colleague, Gal Beckerman, who will be guiding the conversation with me today. Hi, Kendra. Hey, um, Gal is joining us from Los Angeles, um, and he's an editor at the Book Review, uh, which oversee, where he oversees the coverage of nonfiction books. Um, so we recently published a piece titled "The Year You Finally uh, Read The Year You Finally Read That Climate Book," which identifies twenty one books, both fiction and nonfiction. Right? Yeah. Um, can you walk us through that list? Sure. Um, well, so the list was really interesting in conception. It was actually a collaboration between us on the Books Desk and the climate desk. And the idea was to kind of combine our sense of what have been the most important books over the last, you know, let's say 20, 25 years uh, dealing with climate change, with also books that we felt had a certain kind of literary standard or merit. Um, and, and I have to say just personally, so I'm on the books desk and I, uh, I'm the one in charge along with another colleague of nonfiction books. And there's just, we've had this just kind of growing awareness. That there is a kind of a distinct genre now, one that crosses fiction and nonfiction, um, and that has as its kind of center preoccupation what's happening to the planet. So, um, and these can take many forms. There's kind of the concrete journalistic approach. There's uh, more imaginative, speculative, dystopian books. Um, so our goal was to kind of take a first stab at trying to bring some clarity to what this genre might actually be. And also, and this was not a small part of it, is kind of provide openings for readers who want to know more. And that's why we sort of conceive the list in this way of kind of there's, you'll see that there's headings and you can see it flashing in front of you. Um, you know, what if I've never read anything before? What if I really want to scare myself? Um, and, uh, and the idea of these, this is just kind of an, an, a first opening or maybe not a first for some people um, into a series of books that really kind of constitute together um, a new genre, we think. Um, and so you kind of hit it on the on the, the head on the nail, I guess, is the expression, which is like, they're different, these books kind of take different approaches. Um, and, you know, some of these books kind of take a straight, as you mentioned, a straightforward way to describe the science of climate change. Um, yeah. How does that approach work? So there, I mean, it, it's, first of all, it's challenging. It's challenging, you know, and it's part of the reason why climate change is a kind of a consensus, huge global movement hasn't really taken off. Um, and, and part of it is that the science can be complicated. And so the challenge here is, really writing about it in an accessible way. You know, how do you really describe what a degree or two increase in warming actually means? Um, one of the first, the first book actually on our list is a book by Carrie Emanuel called What We Know About Climate Change, which is sort of a primer. Uh, he's, he's a MIT climatologist. And interestingly, he's a conservative who kind of approached the topic as a skeptic. And then once was convinced himself, really laid out in a fairly slender, concise economic form, um, what the, the main arguments were. And his idea was, this is something you could kind of share with your, your uncle at Thanksgiving uh, to kind of give you, arm you with arguments uh, when, when he starts with, with climate denial. Um, and then another book, just to mention another book, uh, is like Elizabeth Colbert's The Sixth Extinction, which uh, has already kind of become a classic, I think, of the yeah. form. Um, and it's much more if he is like all tell, she's show. Um, and what she does is go to different parts of the world, to the Andes, the Amazon rainforest, the Great Barrier Reef, um, and even just kind of looks at her own backyard. And she wants us to understand really how uh, global warming is playing out in all these different places and to kind of remove it from the realm of, of abstraction. Um, it's something really all these books try to do, even the one, we have one children's book on the list, uh, Jeanette Winter's our house is on fire, and there you can see all, all three books I'm talking about. Um, and that book is about, uh, it's basically focuses on Greta Thunberg um, and, and, and kind of her struggle to get the message out. And I have to say just even personally, I have two small kids and this is, it's, it's quite an effective way in terms of when you think about accessibility to the story, um, if you can 
you know, the, the personalizing it in her story and her attempt to kind of let the world know what the problem is, uh, really for them is quite, quite effective. Yeah, I've talked to a lot of young people and Greta really resonates with them yeah. um, in ways that, that are, are almost hard to parse as someone who's a little bit older, <laughs> just a little bit older than Greta. Right. Uh, um, the, um, another kind of categorization that the books sort of fall into is so you've accepted the science, you know that climate change is happening. Um, what does that actually mean? Like many of these books sort of zero in on the specific implications of climate change because it's like as a climate reporter i know people are often like if it's just warm outside uh, it, people often think it's just a question of oh it's getting warmer and so it'll be hotter when really there are many other effects and sort of which of these books do you really feel kind of get at that the idea of like the impact of a warming climate right i mean in some ways it's like this narrative challenge right do you tell the the, the big story or do you find a way to get very specific and sort of offer a, 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 a story um, of climate change that is very sort of concrete and particular. And a few of the books kind of go for that concrete particular approach. One of them is Jeff Goodall's uh, the, Winter, the Water Will Come, in which he's looking specifically at sort of rising water and how it's gonna affect cities like you know, Miami and Lagos and Rotterdam, cities that are really going to be impacted sooner rather than later. Um, and it's not just about kind of what might happen to these cities, but the psychology of people who live in them now, you know, like real estate developers, and how difficult it is for them to wrap their minds around what might be coming. Um, there's also a book like Dan Egan's The Death and Life of the Great Lakes, which focuses specifically on the Great Lakes and sort of human intervention, and how there's been this series of sort of radical ecological mutations within the lakes themselves as a result of, of people's presence there. Um, and so, and these are the kind of the books that try to pinpoint the effects we're having on the planet. Um, the other kind of book is kind of maybe more, a little bit more sort of policy journalistically oriented. Um, and that's a book like, you know, Merchants of Doubt by Naomi Oreskes, sorry, and Eric Conway, um, in which they're not so much looking at the effects of climate change as this question of who's shaping the narratives, who's, who is, is helping to, I mean, in, in, their, in this particular book, they're looking at the sort of industries like oil and gas that are, you know, funding groups that are helping to sow confusion and doubt about the actual science of climate change. So those are just a few sort of of the more sort of particular approach, taking a more narrower angle. Um, and I mean, the Rescue's book kind of hints at the other side of climate change or global warming, which is it really forces us to have conversations about ethics, sort of like who is responsible and what responsibility do we have to each other, to the future of the earth, to future generations? Right. Um, are there books that take these questions on? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, a very recent book, um, which is Ho Hope Jaron, who uh, wrote uh, Lab Girl, some people might know. Um, her most recent book, which came out just, I think, two months ago, it's called The Story of More. Uh, and it wrestles precisely with those questions. Um, it approaches climate change not from the kind of the angle of the science, but from this very sort of personal perspective through its memoir and observation, sort of what she's seen how she's seen the world change in her own life. Um, and rather than kind of, you know, hitting you over the head with a hammer, she sort of tiptoes up to this simple conclusion of, you know, use less and share more, which might be the most sort of economical way <laughs> to phrase what, what needs to what <coughs> um, I think you have a, a quote there from her. Yeah, um, I actually read the book for you, for the book review. I did a small review. And one of the passages that I found incredibly moving was, you know, part of it's on the screen, which is, um, we wake in the morning and leave our homes and we work, work, work to keep the great global chain of procurement in place. Then we throw 40% of everything we just accomplished into the garbage. We can never get these hours back. Our children grow up, our bodies wane, and death comes to claim some of those we love. All of the while, we spend our days making things for the purpose of discarding them. And yeah. I just found that like really resonant because it's, we've all heard, you know, waste less as a rhetoric, um, but anchoring it in like, the other side of cons like what we do in order to consume to so that we waste so much I thought was really moving and affecting. Yeah, yeah. Um, the, I mean, the other thing I, 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 you know, in this category of like writers dealing with the with the, with the ethics of, of 
climate change or what responsibilities it imposes on us. Um, I think fiction and particularly speculative fiction or you know, dystopian, you could call it depending on your mood, uh, is maybe the best forum for exploring these questions um, because you know, novelists aren't constrained by what we know and think and, and the way we behave right now. They can play it all forward. They can sort of imagine the situation much more extreme and in the future and in a way sort of bringing into relief uh, all, all of these issues. Um, so you know, a few books that f fall in these categories and, and there, this, is, this is a big category Category um, of dystopian fiction, um, you know, that goes back, you know, you know, longer, you know, much longer than climate change, but but has been focused on climate change. Uh, you know, at least some books have been in the last 20, 25 years. So John Lanchester's uh, The Wall, which just came out a few years ago, which tells the story of sort of an island country, which very much seems to be Britain, who's which has created an entire perimeter around its borders to, to prevent rising water and also refugees uh, who are coming in as a result of the crisis. Um, and this whole story is told from the perspective of a young man who is uh, what they're calling a defender of the wall. Um, and he, he sort of deals with the morality of what it means to sort of keep people out in the middle of such a crisis. Um, another book, which has really become a kind of a classic, is Octavia Butler's Parable of the Sower. Uh, this was published in 1993, and she imagines a California in 2024, uh, just four years from now, um, in which the climate also is completely wrecked. Um, water is scarce. Communities also are building walls. And the whole book is sort of told through um, diary entries by a teenager um, named Lauren, who's sort of escaping this reality or escaping north, um, where where the where the where the situation is better, um, and she ends up sort of almost creating a new religion uh, based on what she calls sort of hyper empathy, um, and very much aware of the effects that this that the crisis that she's living through is causing to to, to humanity and to the people around her. Um, yeah, and we also have a quote from that book, which now in hindsight, uh, as we're living through a pandemic, seems more uh, apropos than ever. Um, <clears throat> things are changing now too. Our adults haven't been wiped out by a plague, so they're still anchored in the past, waiting for the good old days to come back. But things have changed a lot and they'll change more. Things are always changing. This is just one of the big jumps instead of the little step-by-step -step changes that are easier to take. People have changed the climate of the world. Now they're waiting for the old days to come back. Yeah. Um, and then there's sort of like the fourth kind of bucket of how do we reconcile, and that quote kind of touches on it, the world that we're living in now with the world that we're moving into. Because we know even if we act on climate, even if we take sort of the big steps that we need to reduce the worst effects, that we've already permanently kind of altered the climate and that's something that we're going to have to deal with. Right. Um, I, I mean, I think fiction is really good with with that category as well, because, you know, I, I feel like we rarely talk about the emotions related to climate change. Um, at least we don't feel comfortable doing so in our daily lives, but there is, you know, confusion and a sense of loss and grieving. You know, when I talk to friends about news stories they read or just this growing sense of kind of helplessness, hopelessness. Um, and I think fiction, you know, can really capture this in a way that nonfiction, you know, might struggle to. Um, so one book also recently published, Jenny Offel's uh, Weather. Um, some people might be familiar with her earlier book, The Department of Speculation. Um, and in this book, she really does such a great job kind of simultaneously showing how we can like deal with daily life in all its mundane detail, but also have this sort of looming awareness of a bigger, awesome sort of planetary issue that's, that's unfolding at the same time. And she's concerned with sort of how do you balance these things? How do you, you know, do something as simple as pack your son's backpack for school every day, but also worry about the future when he packs his own son's backpack. Um, you know, how, how, do you, how do you avoid getting overwhelmed by the, the big thoughts about the fate of the planet, but also not do the opposite and then just shut everything out and live in, in ignorance? Uh, and I think that's something that we all sort of struggle with. Um, then there's also the approach of, of someone, and this is a really wonderful book, uh, Richard Powers' Overstory, uh, which won the Pulitzer Prize a few years ago. And he, he presents a series of sort of interconnected stories going back to the 19th century and the timber wars of the Pacific Northwest and then flashing forward to the present and tells the story of an 11 year old coder. Um, there's, it, it really is just a series of sort of moving stories, but at the center are trees. Um, they're sort of the emotional core of the book. Um, and I just wanted to read from the review in, in the page of that book 
uh, in the pages of the book review, uh, Barbara Kingsolver, whose book we also have in our list, her book, Flight Behavior. Um, she wrote that Powers uh, pulls readers heart first into a perspective so much longer lived and more subtly developed than the human purview that we gain glimpses of a vast primordial sensibility while watching our own kind get whittled down to size. Um, so these novels, you know, and, and, and the books we're looking at, they open up so many questions, you know, can, can writing about the emotional impact of climate change be cathartic to us, you know, allowing us to explore those feelings? Um, and will it help us channel that towards activism? Uh, is there value alone in just kind of capturing the human experience of living with extinction in sight? Um, and then, you know, the question that I think about a lot is kind of, what is the role of the artist faced with this reality? And I, I think our, our, our guest who will come on soon might have something to say about that. Yeah, thanks so much, Kyle, for taking us through the list. Um, I would now like to introduce Amitav, Amitav Ghosh. Um, Amitav is a writer, perhaps best known for his fiction, but he's also the author of a beautiful nonfiction book that's on our list, The Great Derangement, that looks at what he calls our imaginative failure in the face of global warming. Uh, before we speak with him, he will read a short passage from his book. Hi, Gaul. Hi, Kendra. Bleak though the terrain of climate change may be, there are a few features in it that stand out in relief as signs of hope. A spreading sense of urgency <laughs> among government and the public, the emergence of realistic alternative energy solutions, widening activism around the world, and even a few signal victories for environmental movements. But the most promising development in my view is the increasing involvement of religious groups and leaders in the politics of climate change. Pope Francis is of course the most prominent example, but some Hindu, Muslim, Buddhist, and other groups and organizations have also recently voiced their concern. I take this to be a sign of hope because it's increasingly clear to me that the formal political structures of our time are incapable of confronting this crisis on their own. The reason for this is simple. The basic building block of these structures is the nation state, inherent to the nature of which is the pursuit of the interests of a particular group of people. So powerful is this imperative that even transnational groupings of nation states like the UN seem unable to overcome it. This is partly due, of course, to the questions of power and geopolitical rivalries. But it may also be that climate change represents in its very nature an unresolvable problem for modern nations in terms of their bio political mission and the practices of governance that are associated with it. I'd like to believe that a great secular upsurge of, of protest movements around the world could break through the deadlock and bring about fundamental changes. The problem, however, is time. One of the reasons why climate change is a wicked as opposed to a normal problem is that the time horizon in which effective action can, can be taken is very narrow. Every year that passes without a, a drastic reduction in global emissions makes catastrophe more certain. It's hard to see how popular protest movements could gain enough momentum within such a narrow horizon of time. Such movements usually take years, even decades to build. And to build them in the current situation will be all the more difficult because security establishments around the world have already made extensive preparations for dealing with activism. If a significant breakthrough is to be achieved, if the securitization and corporatization of climate change is to be prevented, then already existing communities and mass organizations will have to be in the forefront of the struggle. And of such organizations, those with religious affiliations possess the ability to mobilize people in far greater numbers than any other. Moreover, religious worldviews are not subject to the limitations that have made climate change such a challenge for our existing institutions of governance. They transcend nation states, and they all acknowledge intergenerational long-term responsibilities. They do not partake of economistic ways of thinking and are therefore capable of imagining nonlinear change, catastrophe in other words, in ways that are perhaps close to the forms of reason deployed by contemporary nation states. Finally, it's impossible to see any way out of this crisis without an acceptance of limits and limitations. And this in turn is, I think, intimately related to the idea of the sacred, <clears throat> however one may wish to conceive of it. Hi, so. 
Thank you, Amitav. Thank you, Gaur. <laughs> um, Sorry. That. There we go. Uh, um, uh, yeah, thank you, Amitav. That was beautiful. Um, thank you. And it kind of raises a question, you know, for me, which is sort of what are the challenges that, you know, artists and writers such as yourself face when trying to confront climate change as an issue? Um, you know, you've written about the difficulties it poses to creative representation. Can you speak a little bit more about that? Well, one really major difficulty is uh, uh, what uh, Barbara Kingsolver put her finger on uh, in, her, in her review of Richard Powers' book. It's the durations. You know, novels and short stories usually occur in very delimited uh, spans of time, whereas the uh, climate change unfolds over millennia, over long periods, and so on. So, you know, those, that's one very, uh, a very difficult problem, you know. The other problem, and again, I think Richard Powers' work has addressed this in an absolutely magnificent way, is that when we are dealing with climate change, we have non-human protagonists of all kinds to deal with. You know, there are forest fires, there are floods, there are uh, in, uh, in the overstory, of course, he's dealing with the, uh, with the catastrophe of the forests and the trees and so on. And I think uh, really he's, uh, he's really showed us a way forward, you know, how we can start to deal with non-human protagonists, how we can start giving them a voice. Do you think, Amitav, that our contention that there is sort of a climate change genre is true and if so, uh, are there books, having seen our list or seen part of our list, do you think there's books that we've left off that you might add to that uh, growing canon? Yes, I mean, there, there are so <laughs> many, uh, there are so many books now, uh, you know, that you could perhaps call it a genre, but uh, I, I'm rather wary of calling, uh, you know, thinking about climate writing as a separate genre, because this is not separate from real life, right. you know, these things are sort of unfolding all around us. But yes, I think your list is a great list and inevitably some, uh, some books are left out of it. Among them, I would say Rebecca Solnit's A Paradise Built in Hell is a, is a, is a great uh, nonfiction book. Uh, Naomi Klein's This Changes Everything is again, I mean, it's a sort of great theorization of climate change. Uh, one book that really made a huge impression on me is Carrie Ann Norgard's Living in Denial. Mm. Uh, it's about a small town. It's an ethnography of a small town in Norway and how those people who are very politically engaged, who are extremely educated, mm -hmm. who are actually quite left wing on most issues, how they still don't engage with climate change. And the reasons for that is very depressing. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, George Marshall's Don't Even Think About It, which I think is, a, is really one of the most lucid expositions of the subject. There's David Wallace Wells's The Un Uninhabitable Earth, mm -hmm. a very powerful uh, book, uh, you know, which just puts together a, a lot of the facts and so on. Then there's a book that's not yet been published, but I, ha I had the good fortune to see a, a, a PDF of it. It's by a writer called Ben Ehrenreich. Uh, it's called Desert Notebooks. And it's a mm -hmm. truly wonderful book because it's about, you know, it's about the assumptions that lie behind our inactivity on climate change. And one of the assumptions is the assumption of progress. That's mm. again, one thing that makes it very hard to write about these issues today because we've grown up with these assumptions of progress. And he really traces the genealogy of these assumptions. And you know, it's, it's, a, it's a very good book. Um, two novels that uh, you know, are among my favorites on, on these issues. One is Liz Jensen's uh, The Rapture. Mm wonderful book. And there's Frank Schatzing's uh, book, The Swarm. Uh, it's a very big book, uh, but, uh, you know, it was originally published in German. It's a, it's a really, it's a really fascinating and powerful book. And look, I mean, I'm, I'm myself leaving many, many books off this yeah. list. So, uh, we need another book. list, it looks like. <laughs> <laughs> um, what are the kind, after you, you know, I guess you published The Great Derangement, what, three years, four years ago now, 2016, yeah. right? Um, what, yeah. what are the kinds of comments that you got from readers who have read it? After, you know, is there, is, is there kind of a consistent message that comes up over and over again? It certainly touched some kind of chord, I think, because, uh, you know, especially the book was sort of adopted as a kind of founding text uh, by, uh, uh, you know, Writer's Rebellion, XR Writer's. So, you know, I, I think it gave people a lot to think about and it just came out at, at a certain moment when people were suddenly sort of really waking up 
uh, through the, uh, these issues. I think 2018 was a, a you know was a kind of a pivotal year for climate change awareness, and uh, you know that was also the year that uh, you know Richard Powers' The Ogre Story came out. Uh, it, many really terrible things happened. I mean, there were the wildfires, floods, yeah. etc. So everybody can see now, you know, that this is the unfolding reality that we are in. We are not in an old normal anymore. And you know, even this pandemic, it's not uh, it's not causally related, of course, to climate change, but uh, it's cognate. You know, it comes from this great acceleration that we've really seen over the last thirty or forty years. Uh, you know, the same thing that uh, you know that. Uh, the book you mentioned, uh, the one about always wanting more, having more. Oh, yeah. That's Hope that's Sharon's book, yeah, The Story of More. That's right. Uh, that's right. So, it, you know, that's what's made these issues cognate. If I, I, mean, I mean, sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say the peril that often seems to be coming up with the pandemic, especially from a US context, is we saw it coming. You know, it started in China and then it came to Europe, and we didn't act until it was already here. And it's sort of the same with climate change. We've seen it coming for decades, you know, um, but we're now even still not really acting. And it's, you know, it's here. Like anything we're doing is sort of already after it's the, what is it? The horse is out of the barn. Is that the expression? I like guess the that, horse. <laughs> you know, um, the, I think the Great Barrier Reef is bleaching again this year. Um, yes. So there are general, you know, even if that ecosystem is never going to be the same again, within a reasonable human lifespan. So even if we manage to rein in emissions, no one will ever see that ecosystem the way it was before the first global bleaching events. Like we've already altered that landscape. Um, and so we're just sort of trying to hold on to what's left. I, yes. I have had sort of a, a, a more maybe optimistic sort of <laughs> related to the pandemic, <laughs> which I was curious um, if Amitav has any thoughts on, which is something that has occurred to me is that this has given people an experience of dealing with a crisis that they can't actually you know feel and see in a tangible way which is often the sort of obstacle that's put up when people talk about climate change that you know it's too abstract we can't actually see the reality of it in our lives and the pandemic has been sort of this analog and that you know it's you know that we see numbers of dead and infected rising every day but you know some of you know we're all kind of separate in our apartments it's it's a it's it's an experience of a crisis that you know that we can't touch and feel sort of in the same way and i i wondered if that will open up people's minds more to kind of accepting the reality of of, of climate change well you know i'd like to be very optimistic about that as well uh, but uh, you know what the his, you know many people I, are, are saying that well, you know this pandemic will really wake us up to climate change and so on and make us think about reliving life in a different way but uh, you know what the historical experience actually shows is that that's what people think while they're in the in the pandemic mm -hmm. you know while they're in the pandemic they like to believe that uh, you know everything will change and we'll do everything differently but once those uh, epidemics are over, people just go back to doing what they were doing. And in fact, they do more of it. I mean, after 1918, the great influenza and so on, uh, look what happened. There was this huge acceleration, uh, you know, leading ultimately to the Great Depression. Right. So let's just hope that it, ha that it doesn't work out like that. And again, Kendra, what you said is absolutely true. I mean, the reasons why people are not acting on climate change, as well as why they didn't act to prevent this pandemic, is simply because we have persuaded ourselves so much about this narrative of progress that you know it's become one of the underpinnings of our lives. We just think that everything is always going to get better and better and better. And no politician today can actually <laughs> tell people that you know maybe things are going to get worse. The only one who tried actually was, uh, what is it now, almost uh, 60 years ago was, uh, no, 50 years ago was uh, Jimmy Carter. And we know what happened to him, you know? I mean, he lost that election. There, there is one thing, one, I don't know if I call it a silver lining, but when the pandemic was, I wouldn't call it a silver lining, but when we were sort of ramping up to the pandemic, there were a lot of people on Twitter, uh, the New York City subway started cleaning the subway twice a day. And there were a lot of people on Twitter who were like, oh my God, the subway can actually be clean. And we're sort of seeing ripple effects of that with like the, because we're not driving and we're not flying as much, the actual like pollution is lower. And so there are all of these people like in LA who are like, oh, I can see this mountain now, or in India who can see great distances, 
um, just because there's so much less air pollution. And so I, mean, I guess the question I have is, do you think that people will start demanding more in these spaces where like the thing that we're seeing is so visible? So maybe they're not asking for more fuel economy out of their vehicle, but they're asking for clean air. One of the really uh, positive things is, for example, what Milan is doing. Uh, you know, right. they're, they're trying to take a lot of cars off the streets, and I think that would be a great thing. But we have to remember that every time we feel that, you know, it's good to have the animals back, it's good to have the air clearer, we have to realize also that that is, in a sense, a position of privilege. You know, uh, these same phenomena are ex absolutely wreaking devastation on, uh, you know, uh, less privileged people, especially, uh, let's say, in India, in Africa, people are literally starving. You know, they just cannot, uh, you know, get any food. I mean, I hear from my family all the time. I mean, people around them, people they know, are literally Sorry. running out of food. Hmm. So there is a huge cost, you know, to these clean, uh, uh, to this clean air. And that's the cost that we have to shoulder, you know, in the long run, in, a, uh, in some sort of planned and determined way. Let's turn to some uh, questions from the audience who have been uh, watching this. Um, I have one from uh, Jack uh, who asks, do you find that a book which paints a quite alarming picture of climate change and its consequences can be somewhat paralyzing to an audience? How do you manage to keep optimism when reading an incredible somber, incredibly somber picture of our future? You know, I personally think, I mean, people have many different opinions on this whole question of alarmism and so on. Uh, I personally think that, you know, if we, if we need to always be telling ourselves a, a sort of happy story, then we are self-infantilizing, you know. I think we have to look at this, what lies ahead in a clear-eyed way. And more than that, I think we shouldn't look at it in this framework of hope versus despair. You know, what we have to think, think about it is we have to think of it as our duty. We have to go ahead doing things to make things better because it's our duty towards future generations and towards the world. Right. Kendra, I wonder if you have any thoughts on that question of how do you keep how do you, how do you, when you, when you're reading something that is that despairing, how do you, uh, how do you remain optimistic? I mean, your entire uh, beat. Yeah, my entire beat. I mean, my Twitter handle is jokingly gloom is my beat. Um, so I don't believe in optimism. <laughs> so that solves the problem. <laughs> uh, I, I, I think optimism is a hope that the future will somehow be better than the present. And we know from that that's a privileged position to sort of, we know that there are certain things that we can't bring back, but I, maybe it's just too many years of Catholic school, but I look at it very much through morality framing, which is there's a right thing and a wrong thing. And obviously the right thing is to be doing this work and is to be thinking about these issues. And just because it's uncomfortable sometimes doesn't mean I shouldn't do it, or it doesn't mean that, I don't know, what's the most ridiculous like carbon emitting thing that you can do. It doesn't mean that I should be doing that like you know, because I'm not here for a long time, I'm just here for a good time. Uh, <laughs> um, so yeah, that's just how I think about it is like, what's, what, what, you know, what's the right thing to do? And that's just sort of how I've lived my life, less than hope or optimism. Uh, I want to remind people watching that you can submit questions uh, in the Q&A section, there's a Q&A button, you can ask some questions. Um, I have a question for Amitav uh, from Liam, Liam, Liam O'Loughlin, uh, who says he's currently teaching Gun Island, which we should have mentioned is, is your novel, um, in which you put into practice these ideas of how to write about these issues in a, in a, through fiction. Um, he's teaching it uh, this semester as a course. Um, says many of my students find it optimistic in its love for history, language, cultures, and people in the face of climate change. Do you find fiction's care for detail important? for fighting climate change? Yes, I think fiction has some very, very powerful tools for, uh, uh, you know, for dealing with climate change. The way that fiction emplaces you, the way that it puts you at the heart of an event, all of those things are, uh, can be extremely powerful. But I'll tell you, the strangest thing about running, uh, writing Gun Island uh, is that, um, you know, there was something almost uncanny in it because I wrote this whole scene about Los Angeles, about a fire, wildfire, um, advancing towards the Getty Museum. And that actually happened. Yes. But I wrote, I'd written it a year before, right. you know? 
So in such strange ways uh, is our re reality changing that in fact, uh, you can only write about it in these uncanny ways. Right, I think a lot of writers of kind of dystopian fiction have the, the uncanny <laughs> sort of experience <laughs> of suddenly seeing what they've imagined coming, coming true. Um, we yeah. have uh, Carol who is teaching a course on climate change fiction next year and is asking for any recommendations you may have for books that are most accessible for college age readers. I wonder if, if either of you have an idea of kind of what might be best to put in the hands of, of, of a college age reader. Um, it's an old book, but I really, I read it in college. It's called Earth Odyssey by um, Mark Hertzgaard. I think it's like 25 years old and it's not strictly a climate change book. It's an environmental book. So it touches on climate change, but it's bigger. He spent seven years traveling the world in search of our environmental future. Mm -hmm. And what I really liked about it is it's kind of like each chapter is almost like an essay or like a reported piece. Mm -hmm. And he touches on a bunch of issues and he also touches on like issues of inequity, for example. So like, it's easy to say that you shouldn't burn coal if you're not living in a home that's freezing in winter. So he kind of like touches on like sort of the like underlying tensions that are why we can't just suddenly, I don't know, I'll rely on wind energy overnight. It's also there's some issues with like, we've gotten better technology, but generally the book still holds up. Can you tell us the title again, Kendra? It's uh, Earth Odyssey by Mark Hertzgaard. Okay. Um, Dylan, oh. Uh, oh, sorry, Amitabh, do you have a suggestion for a college student? Well, uh, she was asking uh, for, uh, for novels, I imagine. For uh, what? She was asking about novels. Oh, that's right. Novels, yeah. yes, it's true. Yes. Sorry, that's wrong. Yeah. <laughs> no, 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 but <laughs> nonfiction is, is helpful too. Yes, yes. I think Liz Jensen's uh, The Rapture would really um, appeal to um, young readers. I mean, it's, and, it's, and it's a short book, so that might be a good, um, you know, a good addition to a course. Right. Um, there's a, a question from an anonymous uh, asker who says, you know, men, says that there are some serious skeptics about climate change uh, who seriously doubt the science. And what do you say to them? Well, Kendra, why don't you answer? <laughs> um, I was going to say I don't. Um, we know now, like Yale has really excellent data. George Washington has really excellent data. Every county in the United States, more people accept the science than don't accept the science. So actually skeptics are in the vast minority of people. And so I try not to give them extra intention because amplification of misinformation is a really big problem. Obviously that's a different question if it's a family member and how do you engage with that family member? But just like broadly speaking, I try not to unless there's a reason for me to. Um, so if something is so public that it's, it's worthy, like if this message is getting out there, it's worthy to counteractive, but I'd rather not give that message more oxygen. I agree. Uh, I also feel that, uh, you know, engaging with those denialist points of view is, um, is pointless. You know, I mean, there's, if someone has actually looked at all the data, all the material and come to that conclusion, then nothing I can say will change their mind. You know, I mean, it's, there's a mountain of evidence out there. They just have to look for it. Right. I think like true denialists are less than 13% of the U.S. population. They think they're closer to 30 to 40% because people don't talk about climate change very often. And so if you really want to make an impact, talk about climate change more. And not with denialists, but with your friends, with your family. Like make that more of a thing that you talk about as opposed to talking about it once a month, which is about average. I would add, though, something else that, you know, I don't, we often treat this issue of denialism as a kind of cognitive thing that, you know, they've, they've read a certain amount of material and come to a certain judgment. But I think there's something else behind it. You know, there's, there's something unsaid behind it, which is what is unsaid is that, yes, climate change is going to happen, but it won't happen to me. Mm. It will it'll hit the poor. It will hit uh, people in faraway countries. You know, that's the narrative that people have come to believe in. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a very dangerous kind of narrative. Uh, unfortunately, you know, we've uh, helped to create that narrative in the sense of always talking about, you know, climate change will always affect the poor. And of course it will, but it'll affect, uh, it'll affect you in proportion to how much you have. That's really the, uh, that's really the point, you know. And we've, at least in the US, we've also coupled it with other values. So if you accept the science of climate change, then people think that also means you have to love tofu. And you, you, you don't, <laughs> like, like these are mutually exclusive things. 
Um, and so that's why like denialism, for example, only really happens in four countries. It's us, Canada, the UK and Australia. Pretty much nowhere else is there a coordinated denialist movement. And so that's sort of circling back to like the decoupling of like, so from that perspective, when I write, I really do try to be cognizant that I'm not coupling the science with the broader value when they don't belong together. You're right. I mean, and really, there's such a strong correlation between denialism and English speaking countries, you know, it's a kind of uh, strange aspect of the Anglosphere, you might call it. I think we have, might have time for one more question here. Um, how can books about climate change reach audiences beyond the traditional audience of students and environmentalists? Um, maybe I, if I can take a first stab at this, I, I think part of what's emerged from, you know, just our conversation about this list, and I think part of our motivation for doing the list was to show how so many of these books can be just deeply accessible, uh, despite people sometimes like mental blocks uh, against thinking about and engaging with climate change. And um, it seems to me that if authors sort of think about um, how to create, you know, fiction that has, that has all the, all the great elements of fiction that, that, that people always love, but just put, you know, deal, the, the confront and wrestle with these, with these subjects. Um, or they think about nonfiction, when you think about nonfiction, that reporters sort of emerge, you know, find the details, uh, find the specificity in the story that really makes it, gives it sort of color and, 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 and brings it to life. That that's sort of, you know, the, the more books we have like that, the more kind of, avenues there will be for people to engage with with this issue um, and the more they'll want to just because the books themselves will be good books uh, beyond just being about climate change. That's uh, that's my concern about this whole idea about a climate genre right. you know because once you establish a, a genre people just w can, can walk past it right. you know they do, it's as if you know writing about the climate were like writing about extraterrestrials you know. Right. So that, it's very, very important that we recognize that this is not separate from our reality. It's within our reality. Yeah. And here again, let me say that, uh, you know, in nonfiction, certainly Kendra and her, her colleague, Somini Sengupta, have, found, have written so many powerful and wonderful stories about, uh, about these issues. They've certainly found a way of making these events extremely immediate. Yeah. Cool. So thank you so much. We're actually out of time, but this has been great. Um, thank you, Gal and Amitav, for your time. And thank everyone who joined us for today's session and for your questions. Um, for our Greenhouse series on Friday, we joined climate reporter John Schwartz as he speaks with young climate leaders Jamie Margolin and Vanessa Nakate, along with Earth Day co-founder Dennis Hayes. Um, that event starts at 1130 Eastern time, and you can register for our full slate of digital events by going to timesevents.nytimes.com. Uh, recording of today's event and other events in the Greenhouse series will also be available on timesevents.nytimes.com. And we look forward to seeing you again. Thank you so much for everything. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thanks. Bye. Bye.